Romans chapter 11, let's begin reading at verse 18. We've been reading the entirety of the chapter in previous messages, but we'll just take it up at verse 18 and read through verse 24. Boast not against the branches, speaking to the Gentiles who have been grafted in. Boast not against the branches, but if thou boast, thou bearest not the root, but the root thee. We need to keep that in mind. Christ bears us, not, not vice versa. Thou wilt say then, the branches were broken off, that I might be grafted in, as though they're gloating in this well, because of the unbelief, they were broken off, and thou standest by faith. Be not high-minded, but fear. For if God spared not the natural branches, take heed, lest he also spare thee not. Behold, therefore, the goodness and severity of God on them that fell, severity, but toward thee, goodness, and notice this, if thou continue in his goodness, otherwise thou shalt be cut off. And they also, if they abide not still in unbelief, shall be grafted in. For God is able to graft them in again. For if thou wert cut off, cut out of the olive tree that which is wild by nature, and were grafted contrary to nature into a good olive tree, how much more shall these, which be the natural branches, be grafted into their own olive tree? The gospel of grace, the gospel of grace that we preach is a holy making gospel. Yet the doctrines of grace have been erroneously held by so many that causing them to be turned into lasciviousness, causing the grace of God, as Jude warned, that certain men have crept in unawares and they've turned the grace of God into lasciviousness. How did they do that? Well, it would be by preaching such a gospel that if we're saved by grace, then it really doesn't matter how we live. If it's all by grace and not by works, then let us sin that grace may abound. That is the, the proposition that Paul put forth in formerly in this study, and that he anticipated that when he had so thoroughly shown that salvation is not by works, that it is by grace, and that God's grace covers all sin, then what is the incentive to walk in holiness? Let us sin. Let us go on and sin. That grace may abound. And you know what his answer to that was, <clears throat> to that proposition. God forbid. How can they that are dead to sin live any longer therein? That's the question. Yet there are those who do hold to grace, and they're very adamant about that, but they turn it into lasciviousness, ignoring much of what the Apostle Paul is saying here in the passage that we read, and showing how that it, is only, it only makes sense that we would no longer be living in sin if we're saved by grace, but we would have that life of Christ flowing through us from the true root, and therefore we would be bearing fruit unto him. Otherwise, we would be dead branches, good only to be gathered and burned. But if we abide in Christ, and he abides in us, then we bear much fruit. How so? Well, by the Holy Spirit who lives in us. For without him, we can do nothing. Now, just of the gospel, this gospel that we preach tends to make holy. It is a holy-making gospel. Jesus came to save his people from their sins. His name is called Jesus, 
from their, literally out of their sins. Jesus came, his name is <clears throat> Jesus, given that name because he is Jehovah that saves and he saves his people out of their sins. God who has called us by his grace. Peter tells us this God is holy. Therefore be you holy in all manner of your conversation, in all of your going out, all of your coming in, all of your life. You be holy because the one who called you is holy. Now, this gospel promotes due humility at the same time that it promotes holiness. Just as the gospel teaches us to be holy, it also makes us humble. And we see that set forth here in this passage as well. In verse 20, because of unbelief they were broken off, and thou standest by faith. Be not high-minded. If you are saved by faith, and that means that we are justified by faith, and it's none of our own, it's purely the righteousness of Christ that we stand in, and not ours. We didn't provide this, and we certainly didn't deserve it. So where is it in that that anyone would find something to be proud of, something to take pride in themselves and be high-minded as though the reason that God chose me, the reason he broke off those old uh, unbelieving branches and grafted me in to this, this trunk, to this live trunk, the reason he did that is because he prefers me to them. Now that's what uh, Paul is suggesting they're thinking. He anticipates that. But this gospel does not make us high-minded. It it's just the opposite. It makes us humble. Now the, the path to glory is a narrow way. We know Jesus said, Narrow is the gate, and narrow is the way. Straight, that is straight, that leads to life. That, that road, that path that leads to eternal life is a narrow path. And it has been hedged on either side. The, the broad way does not have these hedges. It lacks these hedges. But God has these two hedges on either side of this narrow way that leads to life. And we enter upon this narrow way that leads to life by grace, not that we were just smarter than others, and we chose it. No, we were chosen for it. And by grace we enter into it. We know that this is true. But nevertheless, it is a way that leads to life in which we are guided in holiness and we are hedged in on both sides. On the one hand, we have the sweet promises, we have the encouragements, we have the consolations of Christ, we have the blessed assurance that Jesus gives us. Jesus said, I give unto them eternal life and they shall never perish. Neither shall any man pluck them out of my hand. Okay, if we're that secure then, if we're so secure in Christ and that's a wonderful blessed promise, then, uh, as I said before, some assume if that's so, we're saved, we're saved forever, we can't lose it. Jesus will never let any pluck us out of his hand. Then it really doesn't matter what we do. We're saved forever. But you see, there's another hedge. On the other hand, we have the threatenings. And they're very clear here. He threatens, he puts forth this warning to those that have been grafted in. If God removed, if he cut off the natural branches, then you better beware. Because if you do not continue in this goodness, you can be cut off. Well, how do you put those two things together? If it's all of grace and then we're responsible to continue in this goodness, it's called the perseverance of the saints. And those that are saved by the grace of God are given a heart for the things of God. I will write my law in their hearts, the scripture says. And they will walk with me. They will follow me in the paths of righteousness. And I will be with them in that. And by the grace of God, 
as Job put it, the righteous will hold on his way. He will hold to that way by the grace of God. The same grace that saves us freely also gives us a heart to walk with him and the same gracious God will assist us in that walk. And it is our responsibility to do it. And this warning is sounded out to those who are grafted in and stand in faith. Yes, our standing is faith. Not our works, it's not how well we do, it's not how well we hold to the narrow way. It is all the grace of God. And nevertheless, it brings these heavy responsibilities with it. Now on both of these, of both of these, we are aware, we are to be aware. But we are not to be preoccupied with either one to the forgetting of the other. Self-examination is certainly needed. You remember when Paul was being himself examined, examined very critically by those at Corinth, whether or not he was even qualified to be an apostle, whether he was really called. And Paul said, you better examine yourselves, whether you be in the faith. How does one examine himself, whether he be in the faith? It's something that we are to do. I think Peter gives us a pretty good idea of how that we are to examine ourselves to see if we are in the faith to make our calling and election sure, as he puts it. He says in the 10th verse of 2 Peter chapter 1, he says, Wherefore the rather brethren give diligence to make your calling and election sure. Now how are you going to do that? What are you giving diligence to? He said, well, if we are in Christ, we've partaken of the nature of God by faith, and we're in Christ. He said, then add to your faith virtue, to virtue knowledge, to knowledge temperance, to temperance patience, to patience brotherly kindness, to brotherly kindness charity. For if these be in you and abound, they make you so that you're neither barren nor unfruitful in the knowledge of the Lord Jesus Christ. But if you neglect these things, then you're blind and you cannot see afar off and you've forgotten that you're purged from your old sins. And then he says, wherefore the rather, brethren, here's what you better do. Give diligence to these things and in so doing, you'll be making your calling and election sure. You'll be making sure that you are truly the Lord's. If you can see the fruit of the Spirit, in other words, the things that I listed there, they're some of the fruit of the Spirit. If you see the fruit of the Spirit growing in your life, then that's good evidence that you are truly a child of God. But if you do not see these things, then he said you're blind, you cannot see afar off, and you've forgotten that you're purged from your old sins. That blindness, you can't see afar off. How many people do you, do you know? They can see very clearly everything around them, everything of the earth, but they have no vision of the heavenly world at all. They have no vision that goes beyond this world. See all those things that are up close, but nothing that is afar off. But we take the long look. Faith takes the long look. It sees to eternity. It sees to the heavenly kingdom. And so an entrance, he said, shall be ministered unto you abundantly into the everlasting kingdom of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. There is a way in which the child of God is truly heavenly minded. You've heard that expression, well, is this a heavenly minded, no earthly good. I've never met that person who was so heavenly minded that he wasn't of any earthly good. Those are the best to this earth and the most useful on this earth are those that are heavenly minded. They have eyes that see afar off and they live their lives accordingly, not for the present, but for eternity. And that is the grace that God puts in his people. We are to enjoy assurance that is based on God's promises and based on unchanging grace, but not so as to give us ourselves a false, unfounded hope. 
After all, Newton said in that famous hymn that we love, it was grace that taught my heart to fear. And it was grace that relieved them. We need both of those workings of grace in our lives. Now let us walk safely these narrow paths that, that run, this narrow path that runs between these two hedges. If we do this, we will be walking safely. Do not presume while neglecting duty, the duties that you have in Christ, do not presume while neglecting. Carnal confidence is a fear delusion. Jesus says, many will say in that day, not just two or three, many. But Lord, have we not done this? Have we not done that? These are deluded. They have a false hope in this life. They think all is well with them and they stand before the judgment even contending, arguing with the Savior himself. Do you think he does not know his own that he's brought, that the Father has brought to him? And yet they stand there and say, but Lord, surely you're wrong. We were so sure that we were going to heaven. And he will say, depart from me, you that work iniquity. I never knew you. So do not presume while neglecting duty and create this false hope. But do not doubt the reality of God's grace either. And we're capable of doing both. We're capable of judging ourselves. And I've met so many Christians that they will they're always questioning, am I saved? Am I saved? And you know, when that is truly uh, on the heart, when that is truly a concern, I found from my observation that it's usually those that probably would have the least reason to question, but they're so sensitive about their sins. And so they realize the duty so much and realize their own failing so much that it caused them to doubt. So let us not enter into that dangerous place of actually doubting the grace of God. So this is, this is how the Christian walks. He walks between two hedges. On the one side, it's wonderful assurance and the promises and the consolations. On the other side, there's the threatenings and the warnings to, to tend to duty to continue in this goodness, lest you also, he said, be cut off. Now these are legitimate, these are legitimate concerns. The Apostle John said, these things I declare unto you that you might believe on the name of the Son of God. Do you that believe on the name of the Son of God that you might know that you have eternal life and that you might believe on the name of the Son of God? Do you ever stop and think, what is he saying? These things have I written unto you that believe on the name of the Son of God that you might know that you have eternal life and that you might believe on the name of the Son of God. He's saying what the apostle says here. If you continue in goodness, if you continue in faith, if you continue believing. You've heard our pastor say this, you've heard me say it, I speak of Brother Moore. If I can stop believing, I'll stop being saved. This faith that we have is given to us and it's faith that keeps on believing. You say, well, is it possible for a true believer to ever stop believing? No, it isn't. He will continue on. But there are those who have a false confidence. They do stop believing. What does this mean, stop believing? Well, he goes on to say, and the, the context there in 1 John chapter 5, when he says this, he says, and whatsoever 
we have this confidence in him that whatsoever he shall ask according to his will, he heareth us. So if we see a brother walking in sin, we can pray for him and know that we have our petition. We have the answer to our petition just in the prayer. God will hear that. But he said, there is a sin unto death. I say that you should not pray for it. I do not say that you should pray for it. What is that sin unto death? Been a lot of speculation about that. Well, the sin against the Holy Spirit, but what is the sin against the Holy Spirit? What is the unpardonable? I'll tell you what is unpardonable is apostasy. Demas hath forsaken me, Paul said. Here is a man that had traveled with Paul, been a part of the ministry of the gospel in this great missionary effort. And who would have thought that Demas was not a true believer? But at the end of Paul's life, that's one of his sad complaints. Demas hath forsaken me, having loved this present world. John said, love not the world, neither the things that are in the world. If any man love the world, the love of the Father is not in him. Demas loved this present world and turned and went back to it, proving that the love of the Father was not in him. Did, was it there and he lost it? No, it was not there. Paul could, or John could say of such, they went out from us, but they were really never of us. Or they would have no doubt continued with us. No doubt continued with us. Yeah, there's a great responsibility that comes with grace, and it's our responsibility. We can't fill it except by the grace of God, but it's still ours to fill. And we see these two hedges keeping the child of God on the straight and narrow, if you will, because this gospel of grace that we preach is a holy making gospel, and it is also a very humbling gospel. Be not high-minded, but fear. Now God's an unfailing plan, and that's what we're considering here in this chapter and have been for some time. This unfailing plan to save his Israel, that all Israel shall be saved, that's the goal, which first of all guarantees the salvation of the elect remnant, as Paul says there in the first six verses. It secondly brings due judgment on the obstinate and the rebellious, casting a blindness on them that they brought upon themselves through their refusal to see, which then God uses to thirdly bring in the fullness of the Gentiles and also of the Jews, verse 11 through 15. And then fourthly, Gentiles are grafted into the Abrahamic covenant together with the Jews. You saw it there in the Sunday school hour as Braxton read that passage. But yes, by faith, the Gentiles are grafted in and received the promises that were made to Abraham in that covenant, which promises set forth the new covenant so clearly and so perfectly. But it is called by the, the inspired apostle in Galatians 3.8, it is called the gospel. That God preached the gospel to Abraham in making that covenant with him. And so Gentiles are brought into this covenant. They are grafted in, if you will. And the removal of the obstinate and the rebellious made room for them to be grafted in to this vine. And of course, that vine is the Lord Jesus Christ. He is the root. He is that branch. He is that root out of the stem of Jesse. In Isaiah chapter 11, where it says, and the Gentiles will, will seek him and come to him. And that's setting forth this very thing. Now in the fifth place, 
This plan that God has in verses 18 through 24 brings out the fullness of the gospel. And then finally, it results in the salvation of all of the Israel of God, verses 25 and 26. But we're looking at this fifth one. It brings out the fullness of the gospel. God's unfailing plan to save his Israel brings out the fullness of the gospel. Notice the fullness of the gospel promotes true humility. I've already suggested this, but look at it again. Thou wilt say, verse 19, the branches were broken off that I might be grafted in. Well, because of unbelief, they were broken off. And thou standest by faith. Be not high-minded, but fear. For if God spared not the natural branches, take heed lest he also spare not thee. Now here, once again, we see Paul anticipating a kind of claim that human pride might produce, seeing that they've been grafted in and the Jews, the unbelieving Jews, have been cut off and taken away. To be welled up with pride. Oh, look at me. God preferred me and put me in. And he saw that the, some of the Gentiles might be thinking this way, that that might be what they would reason, and he cuts them off at the pass. He cautions against the entertaining of any such thought as that, calling it high-mindedness. Be not high-minded, but fear. Can we seriously exult in pride that some were cut off and uh, rather than, can we well up with pride and not be struck with fear at such a thing as that? Or can we become puffed up that we being unnatural branches have been grafted in? That word unnatural there in verse 24 is the same word that we find in Romans chapter 1 speaking of the Gentiles, the unnatural branches. And he speaks of it as being, there it is translated against nature. What's he talking about? The vilest of sins that are committed. Homosexuality. Men with men, women with women, doing that which is unseemly, which is against nature, he says. And here we find that same word translated unnatural. And we Gentiles, and he's speaking to the Gentiles, you are unnatural branches and you've been grafted in. And what kind of people were they? What kind of people were the heathen? Oh, you read the Ephesian letter and you find there Paul is, is writing to mainly Gentiles who have been saved. They were called the uncircumcision by that which was the circumcision. And they were not in Christ and therefore they were aliens to the commonwealth of Israel and strangers to the covenants of promise, being without God, without hope in this world. And their lives, when he speaks to them after they've been converted, telling them to leave that old life of lasciviousness and lust and rioting, all the things that they were involved in before, the vilest of sins. You leave those things because we have not so learned Christ, he said. That's not what grace teaches us. Grace doesn't teach us to sin that grace may abound. It teaches us to walk in holiness. But can we seriously take pride that some were cut off so that we might be grafted in and not be struck with fear? 
lest the same thing should happen to us, and that's what he's reminding them. Don't you be high-minded. Don't you think this is anything in you? You have that attitude, and anyone that has that attitude is likely to one day turn away. And then they shall be cut off. Let's remember that whatever has caused the fall of others, we stand in faith, he says in verse 20. We're standing in faith. This word stands for all grace. Every grace that faith lays hold of. Everything that we have as children of grace. That's what this word faith speaks of, the, the whole thing. We stand in complete unmerited favor. Faith is itself a gift of God. For by grace are you saved through faith, and that not of yourselves. Even the faith is the gift of God, not of works lest any man should boast. So if you stand in grace, he says, then don't be high-minded. Don't be all puffed up. Your standing is not in your merit. It's in Christ. And it's not because you were something special. It's because God had mercy on a vile sinner and saved you by his grace. Faith is our foundation, or not our foundation, but Christ is our foundation in whom we have believed. Faith laid hold of Christ and all that Christ is and all that Christ has done. We laid hold of that by faith, so we stand in Christ. He is the branch. He is the vine. He is the root, we're the branch. You know, many will turn faith into mysticism. We sing a song in our hymnal, I love the song. We have to remember what, what he's actually saying, what the writer's actually saying. Fear not, little flock, only believe. All things are possible, only believe. But you know, some people kind of mystify that. They, it's a faith in faith. If I just believe, believe, believe. We believe in somebody. We bring our burden to the Lord. We petition him for it, like John said. We, we feel like that we have full confidence in him that whatsoever we ask according to his will, he hears us so that when we pray in the very petition, we have the answer. It's real faith, laying hold of Christ, but it's not faith in faith. That little song that we sing is taken from Luke 8 and verse 50, where Jesus said to Jairus, he said, fear not, believe. Donnie wrote an excellent article that's going to be on the website on the web page this week from that text. The discouragers came. Jesus was on his way to Jairus' house to heal his sick daughter. Well, in, in the course of going there, he came across a woman who had an issue of blood and he paused to heal her and to save her. Well, the delay meant that the daughter was now not just sick unto death, she was dead. And of course, you've always got those that are anxious to report the bad news. So they come running to Jairus and trouble not the master. She's already dead. Well, first of all, the Lord Jesus is not troubled when we ask him to do what we can't do. When we lean upon him and ask him for these things, he's not troubled by it. But that was intended by Satan to discourage Jairus. But Jesus quickly repaired his faith and said, 
Do not fear. Only believe. And of course, we know the outcome. He raised Jairus' daughter from the dead. But faith is not something mystical. It's not faith in faith. It's not some kind of positive thinking. Our confidence is in one place. It is in Christ Jesus to whom we are linked by faith. That's what we mean by faith and believing. And we stand in faith and we stand in Christ. We don't stand in ourselves. So how can we brag about that? How can we think we're better than anybody? If we're not for grace, we'd all be in hell. God sees in the gracious operation here that is being set forth, <clears throat> Paul sees a danger that fleshly pride might rise up. If we are received by grace, then let us not be high-minded, but fear we could, not, we could have been left out. The Lord did not have to bring us in. There in John chapter 15, abide, if you abide in me, and I in you, you will bear much fruit. I am the vine, you are the branches. If you abide in me, and I in you, then you shall bear much fruit. But if a man abide not in me, then he is gathered as a branch and withered, and the men gather them and cast them into the fire. They're cast off as a branch that is withered. And men gather them and they're cast into the fire to be burned. Now what is that a picture of? It definitely enforces the warning that Paul extends here and sounds out here. Don't be high-minded, but fear. And you continue in his goodness, lest you be cast off. Abide in me, Jesus said. If you abide in me and I in you, you'll bear much fruit. But if a man abide not in me, he is as a branch that is withered and is cast off. And men gather them and cast them into the fire. And they're burned. So it's a warning that needs to be heard. It's a warning that we need to heed. Now the very thing that might cause high-mindedness is itself a warning. There in verse 21. They are cut off because of what? Unbelief. Paul, no doubt here, as in other places, is aware that there is a kind of believing that is carnal. Can one who is high-minded in his faith really be a true believer? Is it possible for one who believes to fall back into unbelief? Not if he truly believes, but there's a kind of false believing that can do that as we're reminded. In 1 John 5.13, As we consider Paul's warning, we must remember that pride goes before a fall. Proverbs 16, 18. And surely as we are proud of our faith and proud of our standing and gloat over others, we're headed for a fall. We must remember to save a soul takes something contrary to nature. The grafting in is a thing that is contrary to nature. It is something if it's something that you did it's not salvation. If it is a trust in anything that is natural, it isn't God's work. 
If you can explain it, then it's not God's work. We are saved against natural law. It's grace. It's God working. Contrary to our nature. You might remember, I remember it well. I was still in school at the time, but Bobby Kennedy was assassinated out in California. A sad day. And of course, all attention was on it. And I'll never forget, there was one famous evangelist, American evangelist at that time, he had the attention of the people. He said, well, Bobby is okay because he died clutching a crucifix. That, that is natural. That's not, that's not something that's unnatural to clutch or I don't care if he'd been clutching a Bible or clutching some precious memento of his mother's or whatever it might have been. That is natural. That's not contrary to nature. Salvation is by grace. Salvation is in a person. We, don't, we can't judge the souls of any except are they in Christ or are they not in Christ? That's what's going to determine where they spend eternity. That's what's going to determine if they're okay or if they're not okay. Are they in Christ? And the fullness of the gospel, there is sufficient reason for godly fear. Our gospel standing allows, disallows pride and it promotes fear. The standing that you have in Christ, no pride allowed. Can't be high-minded, but fear. It does promote a godly fear. If there's anything that we know less about than humility, it is godly fear. By nature, what should prompt us not to be high-minded, but the severity of God. Verse 22, look at what he says, and we're almost through for this morning, or this afternoon. Behold, therefore, the goodness and severity of God on them that fell, severity, but toward thee, goodness, if thou continue in his goodness, otherwise thou also shall be cut off. It's not just God's goodness. It's his severity. But I'm glad that he mentions goodness first. God's goodness, God's goodness in itself is reason for godly fear, is it not? There's a fear of our parents that is a righteous fear, a good fear. Now this is a lost concept in these days. It seems they're almost lost. Don't see much of it anymore. But parents are to give us our first impression as we are infants. Our parents are to give us our first impressions of God and a godly fear in the home. The father in particular. My father was a good man. My father was good to his children. He was magnanimous with his ways. And I admire him greatly, but I'll tell you, he was also to be feared. Oh, don't speak harshly to the children. You're going to warp them. My dad didn't know anything about that. If we were wrong, we got spoken harshly to, and if we did not stop, it would be more than a look. But he could say an awful lot with a look. Father, the father figure, he is a God figure, if you will, an extension of the authority of God that is there in the home. 
I think the same thing is true with ministers of God. We are to be, in this respect, like good fathers, impressing upon those to whom we preach the fear of God. Godly fear. He is to be feared. And I'm going to tell you, tell you this. If you never come to fear God, you will never come to know him in salvation. There is a fear that is there. And it's a righteous fear. It's a good fear. George Washington, the father of our country, was a man of great character. He was a man of great nobility. Anyone who ever knew him has testified to that. But he was also, it is also recorded of him that he was terrible in his wrath. Any good leader should have both. He must be a man of quality and character and nobility, but at the same time, he must be able to be angry with that which is wrong and that which is contrary to his principles. And so he was both. Included in godly fear is the realization that we must persevere in the faith. I pointed this out already, but he says there, goodness, we'll have goodness if we continue in his goodness. Temporary faith never saved anybody. It'll come to nothing. The Apostle Paul said, I declared unto you the gospel I declare unto you the gospel which I preach unto you, which you have received and wherein you stand. And by it, he said, you are saved if you keep in remembrance the things that I have preached unto you. Same thing Paul's saying here. We have the goodness of God. We have his wonderful goodness, his salvation, if we continue in his goodness, if we continue in the faith. But there's no promise to those who do not. This applies, I believe, to Gentile nations as well as to individuals. Now the word, the pronoun thou used twice, if thou and thou also, makes it singular, makes it individual. There's a need among professing Christians to take this warning to heart. While we know that all who are truly grafted into Christ shall never be cut off. We know that. But yet there is a, a fear here, there's a warning here that believers need to take to heart. And the fullness of the gospel, Gentiles are grafted in but you notice here, so also are believing Jews in verse 23 and 24. And I would just ask you this, are you in Christ? God grafts in all who rather than abide still in unbelief will believe and be saved. We know from Christ's own words what the end will be for those that are not grafted into Christ. They will be gathered and they will be burned. Christ said that himself. And so we need to hear what the, what the apostle is saying here. And we'll look at it further next time. But I would just ask you again, are you in Christ? Have you been grafted in? And again, God grafts in all who rather than abide still in their unbelief, will believe on Christ and be saved. And we invite you to believe on Christ, receive of his life, have his very life flowing through you. And that's what it is to be grafted into this root, the Lord Jesus Christ.